Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 34 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Before I get too far into this introduction, I do want to send out, you know, my thoughts and prayers to those who are in the path of Hurricane Dorian. It hit the Bahamas pretty hard, and it looks like it may just do a lot of damage on the coast all the way up from Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. It looks like they're in for a pretty difficult week, so those of you who are in that path, please be safe. We're thinking about you and sending you our best wishes. Things are good around here, um, but I did have some release of emotion the other day, and I I kind of wanted to share it with you. Now, I did want to put a trigger warning here for those who are sensitive to triggers about suffering and depression and withdrawal and, and even suicide. Um, I want to share this experience that happened to me, and there may be triggers in that for some people. If you're concerned, please skip over the intro and join us later in the program. One very unique thing I have noticed during my benzo withdrawal was how I handled the emotions, and especially the return of emotions. Like I've mentioned to you many times here on this podcast, the return of emotions has been pretty intense for me, both good and bad. And I've been very curious about how I handled it and how I was going to handle it and how that worked out. You know, one of the best lessons I learned during this time was not to block or run away from these emotions. Instead, to feel them and process them and even enjoy them. This was a hard lesson and seemed counterintuitive to me many times, but it turns out that it was the right thing for me. Emotions are essential to being human, and you can't ignore them for too long. Still, you know, after I started feeling better, old habits I discovered are hard to break. I still can't cry, you know, on demand. (laughs) The wall is still there somewhat, and it gets rebuilt, especially as my life improves and I become happier. Now, that's not a bad thing. We all need a balance, and it's something I need to monitor and watch because it's good to get back out there and be a little more quote-unquote normal and experience life on a perhaps even slightly more superficial level at times. We all need that at times. But I also want to make sure I watched this and that I didn't close off and rebuild the wall brick by brick. Thankfully, I still get triggered and the release still finds itself, but where it comes from often surprises me. You see, last weekend I was finishing up a book on tape. You all know I love to read a lot, and both in books and in audiobooks, and lately I've been enjoying some biographies. Anyway, I was listening to the book Robin by David Itzkoff. I've always been a fan of Robin Williams, both of his comedy and his drama. And I kind of felt some, you know, (laughs) ethereal connection out there or whatever, just because his life is always kind of these opposites, this manic comedian and also some very dark inner turmoil. And while I'm not bipolar, and I don't think he was either, but it does kind of have that flavor. And I've experienced a lot of that in my life, too. This weekend, I was finishing the book and came to the last part of the book, which was his tragic death. What what hit me the most was the last 15 years of his life, his career, his marriage, even his health. All were trapped in this downward spiral. His diagnosis of Parkinson's was, I guess, just more than he could take. On August 11th, 2014, Robin Williams was found dead in his bedroom from apparent suicide. After the autopsy, they discovered something else may have been wrong with Williams. They found deposits of protein on his brain, a condition called Lewy body dementia. 
the second most common form of dementia after Alzheimer's. With symptoms including hallucinations, movement disorders, cognitive problems, insomnia, depression, apathy, and even increased risk of suicide. When I listened to that part of the book about his death, I broke down and I cried. Now, I, I, I flat out sobbed. Don't know why, it just really hit me hard. Perhaps I saw a little of myself and what I've been going through in Robin, and I realized I could have wound up like he did. I too was fun, outgoing, and even a classroom comedian for a, a big section of my life. And I too have had the demons, which occasionally arise and send me down a deep, dark hole. And I too have dealt with severe debilitating illness called benzo withdrawal, which affected my thinking and moods and my physical body. And I too was thin-skinned. I wanted everyone to like me much like he did. And when someone criticized me, I felt wounded. I also have a father who is currently dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's and has a similar story actually to Robin's and to mine. But you know, I think most of all, I felt a connection to the spirit of him, to his eternal loneliness I think he was battling with, the loneliness that so many of us have felt in Benzo withdrawal. You know, sometimes when I read a biography or autobiography, I come out liking the person more, and sometimes I come out liking the person less. With Robin, I came out liking him more, but I really felt for him. I realized he was a good man. He had flaws like the rest of us, but he truly loved people and just wanted them to love him back. The reason I tell this story here today is that unlike Robin, and unfortunately my father also, my story can change. Unlike Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or Lewy body dementia, benzo withdrawal is not a terminal diagnosis. We do recover. And some of us, most of us, come out better on the other side. We do heal. We do get better. We do survive. We even thrive once this is all over. And I think those connections just, I know it wasn't direct, but somehow when I read that book about his life, I saw myself in parts of it. And it really hit me. And it really hit me that I'm still here. I made it through and I got through my problem. Yes, my diagnosis was not terminal, but I got through this and I moved on. And some of us don't. And I use this as an opening just to not beat around the bush, but directly address the subject of suicide. Please, I beg of you, if you are truly struggling, reach out. Get help. Email me or find other online support or just find a friend, a spouse, family member, anyone, your dog, your cat, your parrot. I don't care. Find somebody to make you feel alive, to give you comfort, to help convince you you're going to get through this. Life is good. It really is. Don't let the demons win. Find your hope. Please, if you are desperate and having any feelings of suicide, get help. Visit our suicide prevention resource page at benzofree.org slash resources slash suicide. On that page, we have phone resources, text resources, internet resources from all over the globe. I put a link to this page in our show notes. Benzo withdrawal is a temporary condition. That's why it's called withdrawal. It's not a terminal illness. You do get better. Your body is working like crazy, trying to heal itself the best way it knows how. That's what all these symptoms are. So give it time. Have the patience. You will get there. Please help your body heal the way it's trying to heal. I learned to embrace the return of emotions during my withdrawal instead of fight them. And when I lose those emotions or when I'm not in touch with them as much anymore, I actually miss it. Thus, I am grateful when life comes along and triggers another release like it did for me this weekend. That pressure eases. And it's funny because a few hours later after that release, I feel so much better. It's something I wish somebody would have taught me decades ago. Anyway, sorry to be so negative on the intro, but you know, there are really hard subjects that we have to deal with at Benzo Free and within the Benzo community. And unfortunately, 
suicide and suicidal ideation, and also violent tendencies. These are some really dark and difficult subjects that we have to address. We can't just ignore them. They are out there, and they do happen. And and I just want to make sure people know that this is a temporary condition. You do get better. Please get help if you need it. Take care, and God bless. Now, today's format will include our intro story feature and our moment of peace. We will skip the mailbag for today because our feature today is quick questions about anxiety, insomnia, benzos, and withdrawal, which is all a mailbag. So it makes sense for us not to hit that also. This is going to be a series of questions about benzos, withdrawal, anxiety, depression, our podcast, and whatever else you have asked me to cover. And it will be quick. Each answer will be under 60 seconds. That's the plan. And don't forget, we still need feedback, as always, questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections, or additions, or any musings on the meaning of life. I've been racking my brain for decades, and I still haven't figured it out. (laughs) Anyone got any ideas? Anyway, I need your feedback. This is your podcast, and the more content I can share from you, the more Benzo Free becomes this community. I still hope it will be. So please, tell us what you think. Visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback, or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. Or comment directly on the podcast blog itself for others to see. And don't forget, sign up for our mailing list if you get a chance at benzofree.org slash subscribe. That is our primary communications vehicle. So if you want to stay in tune with what we're doing and our new podcast releases, please sign up for that email list. And of course, one last thing, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you're listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This helps new listeners find us. That's it. Let's move on to our Benzo story. Today we have a story from Lynn in the United Kingdom. Lynn writes, Thank you so much for all your hard work in increasing awareness about Benzos. I would like to share my story. I would really welcome comments about my symptoms from your readers and yourself. I was prescribed Clonopin in July 2017 for chronic insomnia and anxiety. I was also put on sertraline, pregabalin, and aripiprazole. The psychiatrist did not inform me about side effects. The meds dulled all my senses and did not resolve my sleep issues. Two months later after taking the meds, I developed tinnitus. I therefore wanted to get off the meds. I got off everything apart from the sertraline and clonopin by the end of 2017. I then came off the sertraline in March 2018. My sleep was still not good, completely fragmented and unrefreshing. In April 2018, I was suffering with bad insomnia and anxiety, so I went back on the sertraline in June 2018. I then developed a terrible gut problem with diarrhea. I then came off sertraline in August 2018. My psychiatrist told me to continue taking clonopin for sleep. I took about 0.5 mg to 1 mg every night until December 2018. My sleep was still not good, and so I decided to come off the clonopin. I tapered the doses and came off it at the end of January 2018. All hell broke loose. My sleep went from alternative nights of no sleep for two hours, then the following night more sleep and about five to six hours. Now nearly seven months off clonopin, I am suffering to the point of utter despair. I have chronic insomnia, head pressure, raging tinnitus, weird sense of smell, full ears, nausea, constant dizzy spaced out head, and cognitive impairment, alien head. I never felt good on the clonopin as it never helped with sleep. I have had loads of medical tests, all negative. The question I have is this. In your experience, is it common for people to feel they are getting worse after several months after their last dose? I feel desperate. I'm 59 and can't see a way out of this mess. I'm a professional person, but unable to work now. Thank you, Lynn, and and thanks for sharing your story. Most of us understand your despair and can relate to the symptoms you've described. I'm, I'm so sorry you have suffered so. Yes, Symptoms can ramp up months after the last dose. We, we are each different in our response to withdrawal, so it varies greatly. But 
I can say in my experience, especially with clonopin, symptoms often do escalate after your last dose. Now, this does not mean that they will continue to escalate, not at all. More often, it is a series of waves and windows, as we all know. But it does get better in time, and the symptoms will come and go. You know, I know it's hard to have patience in the middle of it, but it's the only real option. Try and keep busy. Take it easy. Get some rest. Take care of yourself. And find something else to focus your attention on other than your symptoms. This will pass and you will get through it. Thanks. And don't forget, we still need stories. So please go to our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback and share your story or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. Thanks. Let's move on to our feature. Today, our feature topic is quick questions about anxiety, benzos, and withdrawal. My, my main goal here is to answer as many questions as I can in the time allotted, allowing us to cover a wide range of topics. Many of these questions are directly from you, the listener, and I haven't changed them at all. Others, I have modified the question to be a bit more general so that the answer can relate to more people. Other questions are just composites I have created based on a bunch of comments or questions throughout the past several months. But I do first want to thank to all those people who did send in questions after my request from the last podcast. I received them from you and I've included them in today's episode. Thank you so much for submitting those. And before I dive in, I of course do need to remind you, as I always do, and I know some of you are rolling your eyes thinking, here he goes again. But this is just so no one mistakes me for someone I'm not. I'm not a medical professional and this is not medical advice or any advice for that matter. It is strictly for information purposes. Please work with your doctor on your taper or your withdrawal if that's what you choose to do. And do not substitute any information here for medical advice, nor delay in seeking. Today we have 25 questions for our feature, and I've divided them into five sections. The podcast and your host, anxiety and insomnia, benzos, tolerance and withdrawal, and withdrawal symptoms. So, Enough for the delays, let's get right to it. Podcast and your host. I don't have much time to sit listening to a podcast, but cannot figure out how to just read it on your site. Is there a way to read it? Unfortunately, no. Some podcasts do include a full transcription of the podcast in their show notes. Benzo Free does not. I'm not saying we won't at some time, but working up a formal transcript each week takes a lot of work and a lot of time, time I just don't have. I started the blog post to offer some printed content on the website, but unfortunately I've been lacking there lately. I realize that. I, I hope to get back and get that going again soon. I wish I had a better answer, but I just don't right now. Thanks for the question. I'm thinking of starting my own podcast. How did you start? I've received a few questions about starting a podcast, and I'm happy to answer them. Not that I'm an expert in any way, shape, or form on podcasting. Just like with Benzo Withdrawal, I figured it out as I went along the way. But since I only got 60 seconds, I will try to keep this brief. You know, I wanted to do something with my experience in Benzo Withdrawal, and as many of you know, that's why I wrote the book, Benzo Free. After that, soon following, I launched an information website at benzofree.org to provide Benzo info to people and help support the book. Then my wife suggested one day about a podcast. It had occurred to me, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it or planning it. I had some audio recording training in the past, but most of it was outdated. So just like I did with publishing the book, I watched a lot of YouTube videos on podcasting, read a lot of articles, and even bought a book or two. That's it. That's how I got started. The rest pretty much is history. On your podcast, what equipment do you use? What services do you use? I record on a Rode Procaster dynamic mic, which I'm speaking into now. I also have two Sennheiser E835 vocal mics in the studio for my interviews and panels. These are connected to a Mackie Pro FX12 mixing board, which I had from my days back when I was a drummer. I record from these either directly into my PC or on a Zoom H4N Pro digital recorder and then upload to the computer. I edit on Audacity, which is a free open source editing system for the PC. I host on Blueberry Hosting use PowerPress to load my files and blogs in WordPress, and I've connected my RSS feed to five third-party providers, including Apple, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. Wow, 
I did that in 40 seconds. I hope that covers it. <laughs> if you got other questions, let me know. What's your real name? <laughs> okay. I received this one a while back and hadn't answered it yet. Well, the truth is I'd rather not say my real name on the podcast. It's, it's not that I'm actively trying to hide anything. Anyone can find my real name with a short internet search, I'm sure. Instead, I'm just trying to set a boundary in my life, a good practice, I think, for all of us during this time. And I didn't make up D.E. Foster. Those are my real initials and my real last name. And a lot of my friends do call me D. It's all real. It's just I decided to use that specifically for Ben So Free. And when I decided to publish a book, I thought I created a bit of separation between my home life and my Ben So Free life. That's really the primary reason for it. So please, just call me D. Most of my friends use that over my given name, and since you are my friends, it makes sense here. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Next section, anxiety and insomnia. Some people tell me my anxiety is all in my head to suck it up, to just stop worrying. What would you tell these people? I would tell them, don't you think I would if I could? I spoke to this question in my book, so here's a short excerpt to explain. The real disconnect here is the level of difficulty it is for different people with different thought patterns, nervous systems, histories, genetics, to successfully stop worrying. I have an active brain. Not only do I obsess on thoughts, especially negative thoughts, but I have physical repercussions from those thoughts. I am wired differently. What have you found to be the single most helpful tool in managing your anxiety? I use a variety of tools. Each of these I keep in my proverbial tool kit and pull them out when I need to. If I had to pick just one, I would have to say it's meditation. I realize that this is not for everyone and that it is not easy. It takes work, time, and dedication. But when I get stressed or really anxious or hit a wall and I just have to shut down, I meditate. And nothing eases my anxiety like meditation. That's why I end every episode of this podcast with the moment of peace, which is meditation. Because for me, it works. That would have to be my favorite of all of them. I can't sleep, and it's been this way for months. Isn't there something I can do? You know, 30% of the U.S. population deals with some type of insomnia. This is not a small problem. In benzo withdrawal, though, this can be escalated significantly so. I shared some tips about insomnia a couple of weeks ago in episode 32 titled The Restless Pursuit of Rest, Insomnia in Benza Withdrawal. But this episode is about quick questions, so let me see if I can provide a quick answer. <laughs> therapy can be a big help, especially cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Reducing screen time before bed is also a big help, as is avoiding eating within a couple hours of sleep. Having a full and active day is perhaps one of the best tips. This tires you out, making you, yes, you guessed it, sleepy. Also, remove distractions from the bedroom, especially any bright lights or noises. And try not to worry about it. That only makes it worse. And, and there are so many other tips to help you with this. So learn what you can and try them out. Every little bit helps. Next section, benzos. Are Z drugs the same thing as benzos? This is another very common question that many still don't understand. Let me see what I can do here. The term benzos is short for benzodiazepines. Most of us know that. It's a class of psychoactive prescription drugs developed in the 1960s, also called anti-anxiety medications, minor tranquilizers, or sedatives. This class includes Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, Valium, and many others. Benzodiazepines were developed to combat a variety of issues, including panic attacks, anxiety, insomnia, muscle spasms, and seizures. Non-benzodiazepines, or Z-drugs, came along in the 1980s as an alternative to benzodiazepines. They have entirely different chemical structures to benzodiazepines, and yet they have almost identical effects and side effects. This class includes Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata, and others. When I say benzos, I'm usually referring to both classes of medications, benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepines or Z-drugs. This may not be true for all people, but I try and keep that terminology consistent. Are benzos taken more than other psych drugs? Good question. Let's look at the numbers in the U.S. from IMS Health. 
The total number of people in the U.S. who are taking psychiatric medication in 2013 was 79 million. The top four categories within this total are antidepressants, 41 million, anti-anxiety drugs, 36 million, ADHD drugs, 10 million, and antipsychotics, 7 million. Thus, anti-anxiety drugs are right behind antidepressants as far as popularity goes. 46% of all people taking psychiatric medication in 2013 were taking an anti-anxiety drug. I read an article about Stevie Nicks. I think she was on Clonopin. Are there other celebrities who have had experience with benzos? Why haven't I heard of them? Yes, far too many, to be honest. If you look around, you'll see the stories. I wrote about this in detail in the chapter, Benzos and the Media, in my book, and share some details about a few of them there. But since time is short in this episode, let me just mention a few of the names of celebrities who have had difficulties with benzos. These include... Tammy Faye Baker, Boris Becker, Chris Brown, Chris Cornell, Judy Garland, Margot Hemingway, Paris Hilton, Whitney Houston, K-pop star T.O.P., Michael Jackson, Heath Ledger, Courtney Love, John Mayer, Brittany Murphy, Lil Peep, Ozzy Osbourne, Elvis Presley, Don Simpson, Anna Nicole Smith, Elizabeth Taylor, David Foster Wallace, Amy Winehouse, Tom Petty, and as I mentioned in my introduction, Robin Williams. Next section, tolerance and withdrawal. Can you talk about tolerance? How is it different? Sure, let's see what I can do here. Here's a definition of tolerance from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Tolerance occurs when the person no longer responds to the drug in the way that person initially responded. Our bodies become used to a drug over time through homeostasis. And as our body adapts, the same dosage of the drug no longer has the same effect. And if a drug can cause dependence like benzos can, withdrawal symptoms can start to appear, since your body is no longer getting the same effects from the initial medication. How long will my withdrawal last? I've been asked this question in a thousand different forms, I think, but the core is always the same. How long will my symptoms last? And the answer, unfortunately, is always the same. I don't know. I'll say it one more time and probably many more after this, but we are all different. And that has never been truer than in benzo withdrawal. There are a few patterns out there, but they're not that consistent. Only time will tell. Some people can go through benzo withdrawal with almost no difficulty and they're done. Others, it can last years and everything else is somewhere in between. I wish I had a better answer for you. I really do. I just don't. Is it normal to feel so tired of this, almost like you can't face another day of it? I'm really trying, but I'm weary at five months out. You are in acute withdrawal, according to the standard stages, which can be very hard. Yes, the feeling of hopelessness and exhaustion is not uncommon. I wish I could say otherwise, but I can't. There are two forces at work here. First, your ongoing symptoms can be hard to handle, and it can get very tiring. It can seem endless. There are good reasons for these feelings, but on top of that, we aren't thinking straight. Withdrawal can also hinder our rational brains, and we spend more time in a world of anxiety, anger, hopelessness, and fear. Our rational brains are telling us it is hopeless, but those are lies. It does get better. Your rational brain does finally return, and you do recover. It just takes time. I know you're so tired of hearing that, but it's the truth. When did your emotions come back? I'm literally dead inside still at 19 months off. The return of emotions is a big one for me as I mentioned in the intro, and I've talked about other times on this podcast. It's also big for so many others I have talked to. They definitely do not come back all at once. For me, it was over time. I would have to say they started coming back in the later stages of acute withdrawal, probably one to two years off. And then they continue to increase over time. But for each person, it is different. 
and and be careful what you wish for. I love that I now have emotions again, but when they return, they can be overwhelming. And during withdrawal, this can be a lot to handle for so many. I believe they will come back for all of us, but the timing, well, just like everything else, varies. Do you feel healed now? That's another good question, one I often get quite regularly. (laughs) Not, Not sure I know how to answer that one. Do I still have symptoms? Yes, but they are milder than they used to be. Do I still have some bad days? Yes, but they are fewer and further between. Do I feel healed? Um, yes, I think so. None of us is perfect. None of us are without problems, ailments, struggles, anxieties, etc. So I'll never be perfect, regardless of benzo withdrawal. So for me, the real question is, how am I? And it's all relative. My answer is, I'm good. And better than I was, even before I started taking these drugs. But some of those gains are psychological. They come from the tools. They came from hard work that I developed during my withdrawal. But yeah, I feel healed in mind, body, and in spirit. I guess that's the best way I'd put it. What about suicide? How common is it in withdrawal? This question was one of the things that triggered me to write the introduction today. And instead of shying away from it, I thought, let's just tackle this head on. The truth is, we don't know. Based on conversation, hearsay, and stories, it appears that suicide is not uncommon. I wish I could say I have not had direct experience with this with some people I've worked with, but I can't say that. Unfortunately, suicide itself, even without the influence of benzos or withdrawal, is more common now than it used to be. In the year 2015, for adults 45 years and under, suicide was the number one cause of death for men in the United Kingdom, the second leading cause of death for men in the U.S., and the third leading cause of death for women in the U.S. These are startling numbers. Just let that sink in. In the United Kingdom, a man under the age of 45 is more likely to die of suicide than any other cause. People are desperate and they need help. And it just makes sense with the added struggles of benzo withdrawal and the hopelessness that some experience during this time, that these numbers are probably even higher. Please, if you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide, get help immediately. Don't wait. Next section, withdrawal symptoms. Is this pain, ache, tremor, confusion, depression, obsession, anxiety, or whatever, a symptom of benzo withdrawal? The answer is probably yes. The question is a composite of several that I have received, as you may have noticed. I hope you don't mind that I combined them. If you are in benzo withdrawal and having a difficult time of it, the answer usually is yes. If it's something that can be tied to your central nervous system, and few things in our bodies can't, then there's a good chance that is tied to withdrawal. But it's good to get things checked out by a doc anyway. Just because you are in withdrawal does not make you immune to normal injuries, illnesses, and diseases. Please, get checked out, if for no other reason than to ease your anxious mind. When and how does benzo belly finally start to go down? Is it gradual or instantaneous? How how long did it take you to lose this disturbing gut? Again, I have to say it's different for everyone, but there are some things that appear to be more consistent here. It also can vary depending on which specific symptom of benzo belly. Abdominal distension, Heartburn, IBS-type symptoms like gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, or something different. As with almost all benzo symptoms, improvement is usually gradual. There are so many triggers for our belly, food, drink, medication, anxiety, stress, and of course, the fluctuations of benzo withdrawal, which appear to have no rhyme or reason sometimes. Sure, my benzo symptoms would come and go with waves sometimes, but it was and still is really hard to tell since there are so many other triggers. I wish I had better answers on these, but that's the best I can do. Did you notice your symptoms were triggered more by external influences, diet, stress, etc., or did they just come and go with no rhyme or reason? This is a good follow-up to the previous question. After five years of this, and after talking with others who are in protracted withdrawal, I have to say I'm more in the no rhyme or reason camp. I'm not saying there aren't triggers that make our symptoms worse, such as diet, anxiety, stress, chaos, sounds, light, etc. 
but most of what I have seen seems to lead me to believe that symptoms just come and symptoms go. And most of the time, there's really no distinct trigger. It's just the body healing on its own, sometimes very slow, schedule. Were you having more physical symptoms or psychological symptoms during your withdrawal? You know, that's a good one. I had plenty of both. Um, I'd have to say the physical symptoms, probably I had more of those. So on a quantitative measure, I'd have to go with physical. But on qualitative, I might have to go with psychological. They were more distressing and harder to deal with. I do think I had more physical symptoms earlier on in my taper and acute withdrawal. And then the psychological symptoms are definitely the ones who have lingered on the longest. I guess that would have to be my reply. Why have my symptoms got worse? Some have gone only to be replaced by others. You know, sometimes symptoms do get worse, as we mentioned a couple times today. It truly is a roller coaster ride, and that's one of the hardest things for us to understand. Any of us in protracted withdrawal can tell you that when you least expect it, a wave can surprise you out of the blue. Still, it usually gets better in the long run over time. But that can be very difficult to see since most of us don't really remember the early days of our withdrawal that well. That's where my journal came in real handy. Still to this day, I will occasionally go back and see where I've been. And I will quickly be reminded of how far I've come. For some, symptoms do get worse after the last dose. And the first few months of acute withdrawal, that can be quite common but usually they do ease over time as healing progresses. I have a lot of head symptoms, groggy, foggy, spaced out feeling, nausea, blurry vision, eye floaters, and sometimes I feel dizzy. What can you do to help with this? You know, head symptoms can be really difficult since the brain is where a lot of our healing is taking place. This can affect our balance, our perceptions, our senses, our thinking. Like with all symptoms, it usually is a matter of trial and error to find what helps get through this. When I would feel dizzy or groggy or spaced out, I would often go outside. Fresh air, especially cool air, always helped kind of snap me back into a normal mindset or a normal normal head. I sometimes would snack on crackers and even grab a Coke or Pepsi sometimes, which also helped with my dizziness or vertigo. But that's only if caffeine isn't an issue. The blurry vision and floaters can accompany these symptoms, and usually treating one can treat the other. I wish I had hard, solid remedies. I really wish I do, but I don't. You have to find what works for you. Do you get morning anxiety? Is this a symptom of withdrawal? Most definitely. Still have it, and it sucks. (laughs) It is better, but this is a significant symptom of mine, and one that has lingered throughout most of my withdrawal. I can't even start to count the number of times I woke up early. My head would start thinking and always something negative. Then my stomach would start to churn and my insomnia would kick in. And I just lay there in this state of despair. My best remedy for this was to get up, honestly. If I knew I wasn't going to go back to sleep, I'd just get up. Do some work on the computer, read a book, take an early morning walk, meditate, anything to get my mind out of the looping pattern. If I got tired, I'd go back to bed again and try to sleep some more. But sometimes I was up for the day. I just have to accept it and move on. Mornings can be the worst time for so many of us. And sometimes the best thing to do to break that pattern is just break the pattern. Get up and do something different. How did you get your memory back? I don't really know. <laughs> Do I still have memory problems? Yes, but I'm definitely getting better. I attribute my return of cognitive health to a few things. Keeping active mentally, keeping active physically, eating a healthy diet, and keeping anxiety and fear managed. I think those were the big four for me. Do I know for sure those things helped my mental improvement? No, but I think they helped. Part of it is just the healing and allowing that healing to happen and not fighting it. I think that was a big thing. Yes, I forget. And it was definitely far worse when I would get mad about my forgetfulness. Eventually, I kind of had to accept the way my brain was right now. I was hopeful it would still heal and it is still healing. But even if it didn't, I had to accept the way it was. 
And it actually got better once I accepted that. And for the final question, I'm so mad this happened to me. It sounds like at times you think it was a good thing. How can you think that? You know, I thought this was a good question to close on. I can see how it seems that way. I really can. And in part, there's some of that that's true. You know, first, let me make it clear that I would never voluntarily go through what I went through again. I mean, I don't think I would. (laughs) Then again, I mean, it was hard, so hard and so frightening and so distressing and such a complete nightmare at times. And I would never, ever want to put my wife through that again or anybody else who was caring for me. But I have to admit, the worst part of it, I would have to say, was the not knowing. Not knowing if this is a symptom or something worse. Not knowing when my symptoms will end. Not knowing when or even if I will completely heal. But I know now. I'm not afraid of it anymore. I am not afraid of benzo withdrawal anymore. Yes, it was painful and all that other stuff. But the knowledge I have now, if I could take it back with me, I would fare so much better the next time. Of course, I will never volunteer to go through this again, but I'm not afraid of it anymore. And that was by far the worst part of the whole thing. And as I've mentioned before so many times, I learned a lot, a hell of a lot. And I don't know that I would ever have learned that much or made the changes I have made without that experience in my life. I just don't know if I would have changed like that. Yes, I know I'm going over my 60-second rule on this question, but you know what? It's the last question, and I'm going to break the rule just this once, just a bit. You know, I don't think life is meant to be lived on the sidelines. I want to be in the game. Benzo withdrawal forced me to dive deep, to figure out who I am, to learn about myself, to learn about what I want, to learn about what I value, to learn about who I want to be. Yeah, for many of you, Your life may have been perfect before and you don't want to change anything. And I get that. I think that's wonderful for you. For me, my life was average. Some great things, but some not so good things. And I'm happy to have made some changes. I can't say I would have made those changes without it. I wish I could say I would, but I got to be honest and say, I just don't think I had it in me to voluntarily drop everything, and do this. Somebody had to show me the light. And they did. And I'm talking to you today because of it. Thanks. Wow, that went fast. (laughs) And I didn't even cover half of what I thought I might be able to cover. So, so many questions to talk about. You know, we're just going to have to do this again, I think, at some point. I hope you liked it. Let me know what you thought about today's uh, format for the feature. And send me more questions, you know, give me some more questions. We will do this again soon. But for today, that wraps up our feature. Before we go to our moment of peace, please bear with me for about 30 seconds for, go ahead, tell me. You're right, our disclaimer. Thank you very much. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzofree podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit, you know, before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give you a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I'll play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of the one minute. And that will be the end of our episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place. A place where you can close your eyes. Relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to do a counting meditation in reverse. We will start with our out-breath and follow with the in-breath. 
By breathing in reverse, we start with the relaxation of the out-breath and then re-energize us with the in-breath. Thus, on your first exhale, you count one. On the following inhale, two. On the following exhale, three. And so on. Up till ten. If you hit ten, start over again at one. If your mind wanders, just go back to one again and start all over. This is not a competition in any way, shape, or form. Many of you will never make it to ten, as is the case with me many times, and that's fine. It's just something to focus your mind on for this exercise. So let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. Then let the breath out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. And start counting on your next exhale or out breath. If your mind wanders, just gently bring it back to your counting and start at one again. No judgment at all. Continue to do this for one minute. Next episode is episode 35 and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today and please let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.